I feel like so many of us, we can't tune into our pleasure because of this wall that has been created to protect us, to keep us safe, but it's also keeping us from our pleasure. So how can we begin to gently and kindly dissolve this wall? Oh, I love that. And I'm so also glad that you touched on shame because I think shame is a major armoring and it keeps us from expressing these things that we've experienced, just like you said. And, and we need spaces to hold us so much more. And so for me in my work with women, like one of the biggest, most foundational pieces and why I do whole day ceremonial containers is because we need the nervous system to get on board. That is our body's most foundational wiring. And with that, right, we're on this trajectory of safe or not safe. Can I open and expand into ease and pleasure? Or am I in protection? Am I literally in survival around this part of me? And what's happening in the nervous system is that our nervous system directs our blood flow. So when our nervous system reaches that parasympathetic safe state, it reorients blood back to our sex centers, back to our womb, back to our deep pelvis. But when we're not feeling that way, then it's orienting blood flow away from these parts of us. So now we're literally like, to some degree, you could say like malwatered or malnourished in our sexual body because it's not receiving the energy and the blood. And that alone makes it more hard for us to deeply sense into these spaces. <laughs> Welcome back to the Highest Self Podcast. My name is Sahara Rose, and this podcast is all about taking spirituality and making it modern, ground, feminine, relatable, deeply connected to earth, our pleasure, because to me, this is really what the spiritual journey is about. Growing up, I always kind of subscribe to the more masculine pathway of spirituality like many of us did. We think God is this angry old man outside of us that's going to punish us for our sins and that our pleasure is wrong and that any kind of desire is distracting and we must divorce ourselves from these sides of ourselves in order to be holy. And if I learn anything along this journey, it's that quite the opposite is true. That our pleasure, our desires, our womb, our blood, the earth, the dirt, the soil, the tribal roots, the ancient wisdom, this is truly the spiritual path. And these things have been forced to be made to believe to be sinful because it's actually where we hold all of our power. And specifically for us women connecting to our womb spaces. So when I talk about a womb space, this is beyond your physical womb, but this is the sacred womb energy that we all hold and we all carry, including men, the Hara Center. So this womb portal is really the hologram that created all of life. Every single person was printed in the 3D printer of the womb and literally incarnated from the spirit realm into the physical realm through being initiated and nurtured by a womb and then birthed into this reality. So we all came from a woman, got a name from a woman. <laughs> so we can give thanks to the woman because we birthed this planet. And because of that immense power that the womb holds, the womb has been the most suppressed force on this earth. Systemic rape has been used for millennia as a form of warfare, not just for the actual warfare, but for the generational trauma that it causes. Our wombs have been a commodity, in my family included. My family comes from Iran, which is probably the most, or one of the most, suppressed countries for women in the entire world, where a woman is legally considered half of a man, not a full human. And because women have been so suppressed, we don't know the power that our wombs hold. We are afraid of our, our vaginas, which we will call yonis, which is the Sanskrit term for this, a sacred portal that creates life. Even the word vagina, we carry so much stigma. It's like this dirty, shameful, disgusting word. Periods, we're like, oh my God, you have your period. Like, put a tampon in, like pretend it doesn't exist. And all of these ways that we have been made to believe that our womanhood makes us inferior 
two men. And my own journey of spirituality has been reclaiming my womb space. So I have been studying this for many, many years, and I was so blessed to find this beautiful healer that you will hear from today, Alexandra, and I ended up doing a two-day full womb temple initiation with her. And she is a nurse turned really a womb healer, womb priestess, I would say, who taught me so much about the importance of really nurturing and listening to our womb spaces because they hold on to so much trauma, not just from this lifetime, but also from past. So in my lineage, every woman in my family was in a forced child marriage, my grandmother included. So of course, there's going to be generations of trauma held in my womb space simply because my womb was in my mother's womb, which is in my grandmother's womb, which is in her grandmother's womb. And the traumas are passed on intergenerationally until we do the healing work to release it. And the womb is like a hologram. It holds onto these imprints and traumas. So for me, it was the ancestral trauma, but traumas can live in many shape, ways, and forms. So of course, we have the big T, the capital traumas, such as rape, which might be a subject that comes up. So I'm going to give a trigger warning here, sexual assault, but also the... Sm I won't even say it's a smaller T because it's just as impactful for the nervous system. But any type of sexual interaction that was not a full body yes for you, that is a trauma. And that may have come from your boyfriend. That may have come from your husband. That may have come from someone that you trust. Anytime the yoni was not a total aroused 100% yes, and maybe you even convinced yourself because you wanted to satisfy them. You didn't want to take too long. You wanted to maintain the, the connection. You didn't want to, whatever the thing was, you were made to believe you'd be abandoned if you do not show up in this way sexually, but it still didn't feel like a yes to you, which is why lube, and all these things are such a huge thing in our society because we, most of us have never actually been fully aroused, period. So we're going to be speaking about the importance of this and how we can actually heal our womb spaces through yoni mapping and pleasure and becoming aware of this part of our bodies that holds so much, not just trauma, but our gifts, our superpower, our wisdom, our creativity. It is the sacral chakra, which is in charge of creativity, abundance, and pleasure. So when we can turn our womb space on, we unlock all of these superpowers within ourselves and we become truly unstoppable. So... Let's welcome Alexandra to the High Self Podcast. <laughs> welcome, Sister Queen. Hi, love. Wow. Buzzing already from just everything that you shared and, and so grateful, so grateful to have this conversation with you today. Beautiful. So the first question I would love to ask you is what makes you your highest self? Oh, I love this. <laughs> Let me feel into my body. Uh, I think that's just it. What makes me my highest self, I feel, is living in my body, is living in the sensuous, well-watered terrain of my body, the way that supports me in feeling held and feeling belonging and feeling capable and feeling connected to source. Yeah, so many of the things that I think we're going to touch on today. I agree. The highest self is in the body. It's not outside of ourselves. Oh. It's our full spectrum. So yeah. with you, sister. So I got the privilege to work with you personally, and it was so life-changing for me because it made me realize all of these ways that I was not being patient with myself and how so many of us as women, we are taught to prioritize the man's pleasure before our own. And because of that, we don't even know what it means to even feel like a yes. So I really wanna dive into this and the cues of our bodies. But before this, can you share with us a little bit about the importance of the womb space in healing of the feminine, how we really can't, we can't skip this part? Yeah, we can't skip this part. So the womb, right? For me, I, I speak about the womb as the origin of life because really authentically, that's what it is. Just like what you were saying earlier, we are all descendants of the womb. We've all come from that space, have been held and gestated and birthed through the body of a woman. And just to honor how profound that that is in this kind of shared thread of life. And in that, science and research shows us this, that trauma can be held in the body and the tissues and the cellular memory for up to 13 generations. And that we rested as an egg in our mama's body and our grandmama's body, right? So we were living within our grandmother's womb, literally 
in the real physical time of her life. And I just think that's extraordinary to sit with. And, you know, we're learning so much about fascia right now, learning so much about the emotional holding patterns in our physical cells and tissues. And I'm just so excited to be here in this time for our womanhood because we get to recenter ourselves in our body. We get to come back into relationship with the womb, which is also the cycle, the whole life cycle including death and endings, which also includes transformation, which is also this incredible opportunity that we have right now to be in that transformation and alchemization of trauma as we come back into our womb and into our center. So beautifully said, and that's crazy about the 13 generations, which, you know, for many of us, I think all of us come from cultures where the feminine has been suppressed. So then you're like, wow, I can't even imagine what my great, 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 great 13 grandmothers ago went through. And while that can feel really heavy, it also gives us a little bit of that release of knowing that this is not only ours and we're not just in a vacuum by ourselves, but really this is an intergenerational trauma that has been passed along. And our awareness is the first step in healing it. And we can be the last in our lineage that has gone through, because I find that traumas are often passed down intergenerationally, like the exact same story is repeated with different characters until we become aware. So I want to start with what can we know was a traumatic imprint in our womb spaces? Because I think a lot of people, you know, well, first of all, I had my event High Self weekend um, a few weeks ago, which was just so beautiful. And, you know, a lot of my work is around embodiment and sensuality. And what came up was just so many women felt like they couldn't even tap into their sensuality because of the traumas that were there. So what are some signs that we can tell that we are holding onto these trauma imprints? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's... There's just so many. And really, anything that has made us feel unsafe, separate from, or not belonging within our flesh and blood and menstruation and sexuality and deep pelvis, like anything that has made us feel separate or unsafe towards this part of who we are and this part of our vessel, you know, is a traumatic experience. And for some of us, that might be something like rape or sexual assault. For some of us, it's religious teachings around what it means to be a woman, around what sexuality is, right? Sin, dirty, wrong. We start to embed these in our consciousness very early on, also watching mirroring from our mothers and grandmamas and people in our culture and how they act in their bodies, how they respond to their blood and menstruation, how they act around birth and lovemaking, what we're taught about our sexual bodies as young girls, you know, if we were ever caught in our pleasure as young children. Um, and then we just have, you know, the cultural imprints that I think we all experience as women that have in so many small and big, all equally relevant and valid and powerful ways been made to feel unsafe in our womanly bodies. For me, a big one is the separation of sexual health from whole health in our healthcare system and in what we know today to be allopathic care. And so it's like, wow, in all these moments, there's been fractures around our sexuality, around our womb, around our womanhood and inhabiting these parts of us and what we've learned to be true about their importance, their value and how we can enact and express them in our own bodies and lives and so. And so multi-layered because I think we all have a form of trauma in all of these areas. You know, we, for the most part, weren't celebrated when we first started bleeding. You know, it was like, oh, here, here's, here's a pad, like figure it out on your own. And, you know, it was like other like 12 year olds helping other 12 year olds, like there, there weren't rites of passage. So even just that, you just start bleeding. You don't even know what it is. It is, it is traumatic. And so many people, you know, first sexual encounters were often either not by their choice or something they were peer pressured into. Um, date rape is a huge thing that happens. So many women opened up to me at the event of like, you know, having a sexual encounter, but then their friend being like, 
well, you liked him, right? So it's all good. Or, you know, well, you were just too drunk. And like the blaming and the gaslighting that then happens of like, was this okay or not? And your body is telling you that it was not. But then the people around you, because it's so big and they don't know how to hold it and they don't want to feel responsible for it, try to get you to think that this was okay. And so many women have been living with this their whole lives and were opening up to me. And I'm like, no, that was not okay what happened to you. And you also don't need to hold that shame. Yes. And just the protection armor that then comes mm -hmm. on, you know? And, and I'd love to speak about that. I feel like so many of us, we can't tune into our pleasure because of this wall that has been created to protect us, to keep us safe, but it's also keeping us from our pleasure. So how can we begin to gently and kindly dissolve this wall? Oh, I love that. And I'm so also glad that you touched on shame because I think shame is a major armoring and it keeps us from expressing these things that we've experienced, just like you said. And, and we need spaces to hold us so much more. And so for me in my work with women, like one of the biggest, most foundational pieces and why I do whole day ceremonial containers is because we need the nervous system to get on board. That is our body's most foundational wiring. And with that, right, we're on this trajectory of safe or not safe. Can I open and expand into ease and pleasure? Or am I in protection? Am I literally in survival around this part of me? And what's happening in the nervous system is that our nervous system directs our blood flow. So when our nervous system reaches that parasympathetic safe state, it reorients blood back to our sex centers, back to our womb, back to our deep pelvis. But when we're not feeling that way, then it's orienting blood flow away from these parts of us. So now we're literally like, to some degree, you could say like malwatered or malnourished in our sexual body because it's not receiving the energy and the blood. And that alone makes it more hard for us to deeply sense into these spaces. And when we don't feel safe, when we had this memory that we didn't get to be held in and supported through and we're still kind of like this like unsettled path in our nervous system and body. And we're holding that space. We're holding those muscles. We're trying to contract at our yoni to be safe. These patterns over time, they, they develop into these um, compensations. We develop these compensations in our deep pelvis, these holding patterns in our deep pelvis. And those start to affect, again, our pleasure pathways, our capacity for blood, our literal physical capacity for blood flow and arousal. And so when we want to come home to ourselves, just like you said earlier, like first seed is awareness. First seed awareness that I have this desire to know who I am as a safe, connected woman to her sexuality, to my sexuality, and that that desire is worthy and important and deserving. And then we get to turn towards our bodies, our flesh, our nervous system, our tissues. And there's just so much more possible for our womanhood than what we've been demonstrated and shown. And, you know, for me, that might look like a deep exhale into my hips like orienting to my hips are a safe and wonderful part of my body to reside. A deep check-in with my womb midday, like breathing down into that center. Following our sensual wisdom is, is something that we get to remember and come back to because it informs us so much about our lives. It helps us stand up for ourselves, take care of ourselves, experience the lives that we are meant for. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that coming into safe spaces, starting to work with our nervous system, starting to orient down and into our body. And our body's going to tell stories. So starting to listen to those unread stories so that we can begin paving a new way forward to ourselves. So beautifully expressed. And yes, it's that creating that safety. And it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to even be a sexual encounter with someone else. I think there's actually most of this work is really us on our own. And um, and a huge part of this is we have become numb. You know, we have been become numb to sensation because we have, for whatever reason, it was not safe to feel. 
So I want to speak about the practice of yoni mapping and how we can begin, you know, really getting aware of our centers and, and your beautiful process of really starting with like your full body and getting your body warmed up. So can you share a little bit about how we can cultivate a self-pleasure practice, but like all of the things before that, that actually help arouse our bodies so we can welcome in that pleasure? Totally. I love this question. So for me, first thing is environment, right? Can I make a juicy corner with some soft pillows and maybe a candle? What is an environment that cues safety to my body? Like, let's just really start there. Okay, you know, then can I spend time in that environment with my body, can I just start with breath? In, in my practice, you know, we go so slow. We breathe. We start in these safe spaces. And that's all intentional because we want to begin to allow the body to settle, to allow the body and the nervous system, the blood flow to reorient, to come back home, to come back into deep body. And you might start with just breath, and letting your body again really start to tell its story. So let's say I have pain at the vulva or pain at the vaginal opening. I might first make that safe space. I'll find a time where there's spaciousness. I'll, I'll, I'll slow down enough to have that spacious time. I might rest there. And first just bringing that breath to that part of me because, you know, we, we want the next step, the next edge of intimacy to feel safe and good. And then maybe it's just asking my vulva, can I hold my hands over my vulva? Like getting that permission from our body. Um, in my work with women, we never go to a new part of the body before we get consent from that part of the body. And that's huge because we've lost our authority along the way. And when we take that authority back and we take that choice back, we start to create an entirely new possibility for our experience. And so asking body, can I bring my hand to hold you? If it's a no, respecting that. That, even for our own selves, so that we can start to feel what it's like to be heard in our body and to honor that, know that that no is safe. And if it's a yes, just going so slow, like holding over that part of you. And then when it feels good and right, and we can enter into some curiosity, like bringing oil to our tissues, but again, going so slow. You know, I think one of the traumas that we've all experienced is this like fast paced sexual culture. And for me, like the womb lineage, bringing that back into our healthcare systems and the places that we're cared for as women, like that's a repair. And then engorgement is a cultural shift because now we're shifting the culture of our sexuality and engorgement and arousal requires us. Can you share what engorgement means? Yeah, thanks. Engorgement is the filling of blood through our erectile network at our vulva. And our engorgement is essential to any internal work. Our engorgement is the bringing to blood to that area so that our tissues can drink, so that pleasure can even truly and authentically be possible, so that our bodies can be receptive. So we have to slow it way down. You know, this is not a place where I'm going to go from numbness and pain to absolute erotic orgasm in a day. But can I slow down and devote to my body, to myself, to my deservingness of deep sexual wellness and expression? And can I listen to that storytelling? Can I hold my fingers at that point of pain right at my vaginal opening and just let my body tell her story and listen? And as I hear her, can I orient towards what she, what I need, what I desire, what I'm yearning for, how I'm yearning to be touched? So yeah, slow. And that was such a huge <laughs> realization to me because I remembered all the times you go to the gynecologist and you're like in this cold, uncomfortable room and then they like come in, they're like, yeah, what's your name? Birthday? Okay, this is gonna be cold. And it's just, it's very traumatic. And there's no concept of sensuality in the gynecological world. But I'm not gonna say it's just that because that's just, you know, once a year or something. But all of the times, even us women to ourselves, you know, of like, okay, I have X amount of time, the kids are asleep, or I have this much time, you know, gonna self-pleasure. 
put on the lube vibrator, shove it in. That's traumatic to yourself that you're doing. And then you're mad. Oh, why can't I get an orgasm? It's like you, your body was not prepared. There was no conversation. It's like coming in into someone for a kiss that you've never talked to, mm. you know? It's like you need to build the rapport, mm -hmm. especially for something as sensitive as your womb, your yoni space. But again, we're in this fast, quick culture. And I think because of porn, which is made for men, for the most part. I would say 99% of it out there is made for men. And men don't require as long. They don't, they don't have this physical womb space that needs to be lubricated to open that takes, you know, you shared with me about 35 to 45 minutes of just outer labia. And I was like, never in my life had I spent that much time on myself because we don't believe we deserve it. Yes. Taking up space, right? I so believe that our vulva teaches us that we're deserving of taking up space because that's her medicine. That's how she comes into fullness. And then who am I in that fullness? In that deep, sensual, erotic, well cared for fullness. The vulva is an initiation of herself. And I, I don't believe that we should be doing any work. And, and you know, some, I think the closest thing, some, and it's not, it's not too close either, lovingly, um, pelvic PT, like oftentimes they don't do the vulva. They just lube the fingers and go in and we've got to change culturally. And I want to touch on the engorgement piece for men as well. Like, so truthfully, most men have also never experienced a fully aroused pussy and oh my God, the love that we can make with our partners and the healing that men can also receive when their woman is fully aroused and receptive to him. You know, it just goes both ways. And, and yeah, just to come back to the taking up the space piece, like when women work with me around sexuality, it's like, you know, sometimes there's this feeling of, and I've so been here, like, I don't know, it's our, my lovemaking with my partner and my sex with my partner is not what I want, but I don't really know what it is that I want. Or like, I start to get like friction or frustrated or, you know, whatever it is. And then we're not satisfied. But to know that pulse, to know that embodied ass, to know the yearning of our body, we have to bring our hands to our bodies and really get to know our pleasure pathways so that then we can ask for it and we know what we're asking for and we feel confident in what we're asking for because we can feel how vital and alive and safe and delicious we feel when we're being touched with the quality of touch that is true to our body. So, you know, there's just so much here for us to explore and discover. If you're anything like me, you want more turn on sexiness and sensuality in your life. But often when you go on a walk or something, I don't know, you're listening to a podcast like this or an audio book and maybe you're wanting something a little bit spicier. I mean, I know if you listen to this, you probably like some spicy. So I was really excited when I found Dipsy Stories, which is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. So they bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscape and realistic characters. So I'm talking about adventurous summer flings, hot and heavy hookups, second chance romances for both straight and queer listeners. So you can now listen to spicy audios. New content is released every week and they have every flavor you can imagine. So they're offering a 30-day free trial for Highest Self Podcast listeners. So head over to dipsystories.com slash Sahara. That's D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash Sahara for 30 days of free access. And you can find that link in the show notes. And what you said about it, will actually be so much more satisfying for the man because a fully engorged pussy is going to be juicier. It's going to be wetter. It's going to be enriched. And you shared with me that, you know, our society talks a lot about a tight vagina and there's surgeries for it and vaginal rejuvenation. Our society is obsessed with it. And you shared with me, it's not actually a tight vagina that people are looking for. In fact, a 
tight, tense vagina is not going to be filled with pleasure. It's going to be dry because it's not ready for the lubrication. And that's not actually what feels good. What people are seeking when they say that is an engorged vagina, because that's actually for the man, what's going to feel juicier and plumper and more alive. And then for the woman, you're going to feel like that wet dripping waterfall, like receptivity, like wanting it instead of like, okay, a lot, I think a lot of us women, we have sex with our minds of like, okay, it's been two weeks, so I probably should to keep him happy or to keep this relationship going or whatever the thing is. And I see a lot of women use sex as like a way of getting things in the relationship too of like, okay, if you, I don't know, take out the trash. And it's yeah. it's so sad, you know, yeah. because it's for us. It's not mm-hmm. this thing that we have to put, even that concept, put out. Yes. Did she put out? Put out? That means there's nothing in it for you, totally. you know? And because- and did she receive? Yeah, exactly. Like, whoa, what a different question. Yeah, or achieve orgasm as yeah. if it's like an achievement. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, it's the natural state of who you are. Yes. But again, you know, Put your put your hand up if you've actually spent forty five minutes just stroking your outer thighs and outer labia. Yes. Period. M- m- I don't think there's a hand. Very, very rarely hand up. <laughs> yeah. And because mm-hmm. you know, I think one of it is just the time, right? Yeah. A lot of people don't make the time. I won't say mm-hmm. have the time because if I say who's watched two hours of Netflix yes. this week, they'll watch it. If I said who's done two hours of self pleasure, no one. So if you can watch Netflix, you can self pleasure. Who's been on Instagram for more than two hours today? You could have been self-pleasuring, you know? So so what you really taught me was just the importance of having the pussy be like asking for it from you. So can you share a little bit about like your process of how one can get, you know, I think it's like harder to turn yourself on because it's just you and then you're in your head. Um, So how can we, if we're someone that gets very in our heads, distracted, how can we actually stay in that ceremonial pleasure-filled mindset? Yes, I love that. For me, it really, again, goes back to the environment. Like, let's make this so fucking delicious for ourselves. And, and when we do that, it's, it's like we're getting to know a whole new part of who we are. You know, a well-watered woman, a well-pleasured woman, a woman who feels safe and belonging and her connected in her body, we just live differently. And being willing to be where we are now on the road to discovering who we are as a well-watered, well-pleasured woman. I think that when we start to take the time to really meet ourselves, we so quickly start to experience the difference in our lives. Like so quickly, all of a sudden, we have blood flow going to this regenerative, wise, wondrous part of our body. All of a sudden, we're meeting something that has been stuck and blocking us for a really long time. All of a sudden, we're feeling safer to inhabit our hips and soft belly. And it's like all of these teachings that our sexual bodies and our pleasure give us, they support us in living a more alive intimate and connected life. The intimacy that we're actually craving from our partner gets to become possible. The belief and confidence that we're yearning for within ourselves actually gets to become possible. So, you know, I just think creating the space and coming back to to our worthiness of getting to live such radiant lives as as women, um, for, for me, it just, it stems out and ripples out so quickly if we're willing to show up for it, you know, those first couple times. Yeah. Totally. And I think, you know, it's so easy for our minds to go into like the story of like, oh, I don't feel pleasure because of this, that thing happened and this. And then, then we're out of the pleasure practice then. And we go, and then sometimes the mind justifies like, oh, well, I'm figuring out this really important problem in my life. So this is like worthwhile. And then we're like, then we just go into like problem solving, figuring out, analyzing mode. And then the pleasure is gone. And then we just like give up, you know? And so I think that it's important to give ourselves that like, time period, you know, let's say it's one hour or something yeah. to be like, I can solve my life's problems after this. Yeah, but probably best, better. <laughs> yeah. But the best thing I can do to actually get to the root of it is to create more pleasure in my body yes. because then my body is going to be responding from much higher vibration yes. that a lot of these things that I'm worried about right now actually won't even be in my frequency yeah. anymore because uh. the mind can't, you know, the mind is going to continue to create more problems because the mind 
is a problem generating machine. Yeah. And so I find that when I go there of like, oh, and this happened and that happened, it's just like right now the task at hand mind is how much can we focus on this pleasure? That's what mm -hmm. we're going to be focusing on. Mm -hmm. And then after we can go into the analyzation. And what's so beautiful about that is you recognize all the ways that you have stories of you don't deserve it you know, that you're not worthy of just being in pleasure and the mind and wherever your mind goes to, that's your block. That's your thing. Is it the shame? Is it, I don't have time. Is it, will anyone hear me? Is it the kids? Is it the guilt? Is it the, that? And it's like, that's your work. And, and it doesn't mean you have to analyze it. It just means to override it by creating a new response of, I'm not going to give into this guilt, shame, time story. I'm going to override it by choosing my pleasure. And then, and then it's no longer there. It's like you can in real time heal yourself from that thing. It doesn't need to be years of figuring out. It's just like, okay, I'm no longer choosing to respond that way. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And for me, like when we have access to our deep pelvis, when we have access to our womb, when we have access to our vulva, it's like, oh, actually this thing that I'm trying to figure out up here in my headspace, what if I just drop it down to my body? What if I orient to the way that it makes me feel in my body? What is my body asking me or sensually guiding me with my body's wisdom into or around this? Like, oh, if I just exhale into my hips, like what's the wisdom of my hips for me in this thing that I'm moving through? I also would love to touch here on the vagus nerve, which kind of is our reservoir of our nervous system. And our vagus nerves run at our vagus nerves, yeah, runs at this like really amazing ratio, which is 80-20. 20% of the vagus nerve goes from our brain and our head down to our body, 80% from our body to our brain. We're just so used to operating out of our headspace. And again, that's that nervous system blood flow that I talked about earlier. We either have blood going to our sex centers and our deep organs because we feel safe or we don't. But 80% of that nerve travels from body to brain. Like how much wisdom is in our bodies and what would it be like to make choice through the truth of our bodies instead of the stories and conditioning in our head. I think that excites me. That feels like aliveness. Yeah. So true. And I actually read that when we have cervical orgasms, we actually reset our nervous systems because of how deeply healing it is. So we spoke a bit about the importance of really stroking your outer thighs, your outer labia, getting engorged, getting to a place where you receive a yes from your body, really teasing yourself, getting your yoni to be like, I'm ready for penetration. Um, now, can you share where, can you share a little bit about the vaginal opening and the importance of this portal? Totally. Uh the vaginal opening. Wow. A I love your passion for it too. You're like, <laughs> oh, vaginal opening. Love her. It's just love, I love it. her. Yeah. We should feel this way about our pussies, period. <laughs> yes. Because she does invite us in. And oh my goodness, experiencing that like internal receptivity in our bodies when she's wet, when she's engorged, when she's ready, when we feel safe, when blood flow is present, this entirely new possibility of sensation becomes alive and accessible in our internal reservoirs. And our yoni is really, again, only ready to receive after we're engorged and aroused with our best girlfriend, the vulva, who, if we could just give one last touch to the vulva, no woman's vulva is the same. The art, I love seeing the art of the different vulvas because you're like, wow, they're so unique and beautiful and different. I went to this workshop at Burning Man a few years ago that was a yoni gazing workshop. And basically we were paired, you know, it was all women and she had to, you know, we both had to do this, but like open up her legs. And for 20 minutes, I had to just stare into her yoni and tell her what I loved about it. Oh my God. And it was so difficult because I, you know, first of all, just staring at anything for 20 minutes is hard, but I wanted her to feel so safe. And it was so interesting for me because I had never stared at a yoni in my life, you know, let alone someone else's little and that long. So I was like, 
even like, it was like hard for me to be like, what are the compliments I would even give it, you know? Cause you're just not used to it. And then, um, and then like receiving that back. And I was like noticing how I was like, kind of like disembodying myself. Like I was like, um, dissociating kind of, because it's so vul vulnerable, vulnerable to do that. You're just like, okay, like get out of there rather than like actually receiving it. And then we went around and, um, you know, really saw so many different ones yeah. and so many women were crying and having oh. these really cathartic experiences because they had never been witnessed, you yeah. know, like they had been penetrated, married, but never witnessed. Never witnessed. Oh. And never complimented. Right. And so many women have stories, you know, labiaplasty. Yes. I've heard that's like the number one surgery. Oh, it's so oversold, especially to our younger generation right now. It's it's like it's it's increasing exponentially every single year. But on our insecurities and on our shames and on a really broken narrative that something is wrong with our anatomy and nothing is. Yeah. Yeah. And that to me was just such a beautiful practice of, you know, and, and a great practice that we can do at home is just gazing in the mirror and looking at your yoni and it will bring up a lot for you, shame, disgust, like unwillingness to look at it. But if we feel that way around ourselves, how do we expect someone else to worship our yonis when we can't worship our yonis? Totally. Yeah. I have a workshop called Volvo Worship. It is something that I'm so passionate about. I don't think that our vulvas get nearly enough love. And also like coming into relationship to what is the sacred expression of my vulva, of my labias, because there's literally not another vulva like mine in the whole world. They're and like little snowflakes. They are like little <laughs> snowflakes, like the most sensuous, delicious, radiant snowflakes ever. I love that so much. And like, what if we were told that story? What if we walked around since we were little girls knowing like I have something so unique and sacred between the leg, my legs that is unlike any other vulva? Instead, I remember in high school, there were like rumors like, oh, so-and-so has an Audi vagina and this. And it was so mean, you know? And yeah, and just like the comparison and and all of the stories that we have around it, the shame that we have around it, and this idea that there's like a pretty pussy versus a non, which I think is also based on porn, and we're just shown a certain type, and then that type is what's decided, and they're all so beautiful in all stages, so and they're all unique ways. Yeah, to all my long labia women, you are Shout amazing. Shout out to you, yes. Shout out, which is honestly like 90% of the vulvas that I see. Oh, really? Wow. It's actually so much more common. Hmm. Really interesting. Is it like a 50? What is there? I don't even, we don't even know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And I, I think it's not even a long versus short. It's there are many different shapes. Shapes, expressions. Yes. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. 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 But coming back to our girlfriend, the Yoni and the vaginal canal, you know, this is such a why. I mean, all for me, all parts of our body are wise and wondrous, but, but she is wise and wondrous. And there's so much that can happen in our internal reservoir. I was convinced until I was about 21 or 22 that I could not have internal orgasms. And I really just like, I just like let that go for myself. I just thought, oh, like my body doesn't work like that. And that makes me so sad. And I think a lot of women, I mean, I even have clients who are like 50, 60, 70, who are still carrying that belief. What's actually happening is that more than likely we have hypertonic muscles, really tense muscles internally. Our yoni is the interweaving of tissue, of fascia, of ligaments, of musculature. And then the top of our yoni is the cervix, the mouth of the womb, our innermost space, the space of life and creation. I mean, just to give reverence and respect to this part of our body, we know that the vagus nerve comes to the cervix, which I know you touched on just a little bit ago on the cervical orgasm and how that illuminates our whole body. It's so life-giving. And our yoni herself is like this lotus. She deserves to be plump. She deserves to be well. So many of us don't know that we have multiple internal orgasmic spots in our yoni. And so many of us endure fast, quick penetration, unlubricated, or like I, what I guess I want to rephrase that, 
unengorged, unenroused penetration. And then we have mass amounts of lubrication trying to compensate, right? And that can create micro tears. I mean, a lot of women have internal pain. A lot of women have cervical pain with deep penetration. And it just doesn't have to be that way. You know, like that's why for me, I do what I do. Like hands on ceremonial care for our bodies. We have to integrate these parts of ourselves back into our understanding of whole health. And we are just so deserving of so much more within this part of us. And, you know, I'm always asking like, what do our lives become when we feel deeply safe in our innermost reservoirs? Your message deserves to be heard. I am so sick of meeting these incredible people with such riveting and powerful stories who aren't sharing it with the world because they don't feel like they are confident speakers. Because the thing is, speaking is a skill that you can develop. I didn't just wake up with the ability to speak like this, but rather it's something that I learned through practice. So I've put together what I've learned from over seven years of this podcast, 500 plus episodes, speaking on stages, coaching, all in my revolutionary 21-day Speak With Soul method. Now, this course can take anyone from an awkward to a confident, radiant speaker in just 10 minutes a day. So if you're interested in checking it out and seeing the incredible success stories from people who have done this course, head over to speakwithsoulcourse.com. Again, that's speakwithsoulcourse.com soulcourse.com. And you can find that link in the show notes because we need to hear your message. So beautifully expressed. And what you showed me is to really start with one side of your yoni and feel into the different parts. So we talked about now the vaginal opening and really stroking and getting that to a place that it feels receptive. And then once you enter into the actual vaginal canal, would you recommend starting with the left or the right side? Does it does it matter? And what is like the the kind of the the finger pattern that you were doing? Yeah, beautiful. So really ask your body can I, may I enter you, right? Get that yes. Feel what that's like. Let's really get to know our yeses and our nos. And again, if it's a no, okay, what, what do you need, body? Is there anything that you need to feel more safe? I also often invite sound around the vaginal opening because that's like the mouth of our yoni. And how many times does that part of us become tense or tight or clenched? Or maybe for, for some women, they've always held really tight there. Or their no didn't get to be heard there. And that boundary and threshold of their body was crossed. So feeling our nose is a really very healing and sacred thing. Um, but when we do get that yes, that incredible yes, one feeling, that's a gift. Wow. Here I am in some deep intimacy with my body. And when we arrive inside, it feels so good for me to just rest my finger internally and like listen there for a moment. In my pussy parlor workshop, we go through the whole body and we really get to know our anatomy. I know that for a lot of women, like we don't really fully know our anatomy. And so for me, the way that I teach pelvic mapping or yoni mapping is like understanding our anatomical landscapes so that we can be really body literate and know what we're feeling where. Another big thing that women discover internally is like we might have pain in one space, but it's not actually our whole yoni. So really understanding, oh, where is that pain actually stemming from? And that actually over here, maybe there's some ease. And so I like to think when we do self-mapping of kind of like two rings. And if your body says, I want to go to the left first, going there. If your body says, I want to go to the right first, you know, going there. So when you there. say two rings, make a circle mm. with your finger two times. Yeah, like at the first, like maybe inch depth and then okay. a little deeper. Okay, so, so you like put your finger depths. like one inch, do make a circle, feel into any tense or tight areas, any yeah. areas of pain. If there is an area of pain, should you focus there? How, how sh yeah. should you avoid? What should you do? Such a great place to just rest your finger and listen. Like let your body's story be heard. Take some really deep breaths with her. Let your exhale be extended. Explore a little sound, a little vibration, you know? 
And then, yeah, around that first step, just traveling, listening. You might, you might envision it like a clock. And, and that clock, you know, you might go around. Notice how the left feels. Spend a little bit of time there at each point. How does this tissue feel? Is she firm? Is she tense? Is she alive? Is there a blood pulse? Yeah, there's so much to notice. And then just slowly making our way, again, hearing that story. And when we feel that tightness, when we feel pain, like I always tell my clients, you know, that's not bad. That's your body right there saying, come love me. X marks the spot, baby. Like where we have pain and tension and tightness, X marks the spot. Let's go there. Our body in that exact place is saying, I need love. I've been holding. I've been stressed. I'm imbalanced. You know, I've been compensating or I've been armored around this really deep emotional memory. And that's why, you know, I, I also advocate for like us being in, in safe and sacred spaces as women because to be held by another woman or to be held in a circle in a group of women, it helps us regulate and it helps us feel safer to let go and to start to really feel. And sometimes on our journey, we might need that, you know, but we all deserve to bring our hands to our bodies as curious learners of our terrain and of our tissues and of our own landscapes. Wow, what you just said about how X marks the spot and that's your body asking to be loved right there is just such a powerful reframe because we do hold so much shame as women around why do I have pain? Why do I have numbness? What's wrong with me? Rather than how is my body asking me to be loved in that place? And Yes, a lot of the stories come up, you know. We realize maybe that was the spot that you held onto the story that sex with me is not enough. My body is not enough. My body is not able to experience pleasure. My body is not mine. My body is not safe. It's not safe for me to be here. So many different things that we hold onto and it's like it lives in a point in your body. And for most of us, it will live in some space in our womb because these things are all related to our sexuality. That it's like, we can't talk about embodiment without talking about the way that our womb spaces are holding this because sexual trauma is going to be housed in our sexual organs. And the beauty of it is it doesn't stay painful or numb forever. Yes, That very spot that you might feel the pain or the tension or just nothing. You know, there might be areas that you're just like, I don't feel anything here with continual touch, just very gentle touch, like opening something up, that very spot will become orgasmic. Absolutely. And go slow. And then if we think we're touching ourselves slow, go a little slower. <laughs> that's, yes. my, that's what I always share with my clients because we just are used to fast and quick. But really, our yoni is gentle and deep. Oh my God, she's so deep. So what happens when I touch and I listen and my finger stays and hears that part of me and then sinks in a little deeper? And now we have blood flow coming in. Now we have lymph clearing. Now we have nerve reawakening, right? And this is where our sensual body really gets to heal and come alive. I want to speak about the energy of disgust. Because this is a huge energy that came up for me and I know for many women that I speak to around actually using your fingers inside your vagina because we are like afraid of our inner organs. It's like, oh, it's like an organ. It's my body. Like, oh, and it can bring up this feeling of of disgust. And that's why a lot, I see these girls with these long nails. I'm like, how do you Yeah, we got to be careful with our long nails. <laughs> but I'm assuming they don't, you know, you you literally can't with these long acrylic nails with diamonds and gemstones. I'm like, you, you can't because most women these days just use vibrators. They yeah. don't use their own fingers. Fingers like, first. Exactly. There was yeah. this like funny meme and it was like, when I use my fingers for self-pleasure instead of a vibrator, vibrator and it was like this like medieval lady. Oh my God. <laughs> and the fact that that is being shared so yeah. much shows that as a society, yeah, we are not using our fingers. Yeah. We are just using this mechanical battery operated thing that doesn't, it's not what you, it's, sure you can use it. That's a different practice, you know, but a yoni mapping is you 
you must, and you showed me, can you share like the importance of like actually using your fingers and the connection between your fingers and your tissues? Oh yeah. I mean, right now when we bring our hands to our body, we're completing our own energetic circuitry. Like, wow. And our fingers are so wise and so highly innervated. And if we're not listening with our fingers to the texture of the tissue, to the expression, whether it's tense or holding, we actually might bypass some pain signals with a vibrator or with a wand because it's not as attuned. We must bring our fingers to our flesh, to our beautiful tissues to feel them so that we can really touch them and be aware of the quality of touch that they're asking for. And especially when we have numbness or pain, because when we look at the nervous system, like, I, you know, some people might call it like a ladder. Like we have our parasympathetic and, you know, this is a little patriarchal, but we place it at the top. Yay, parasympathetic. And then in the mid range, we have like our sympathetic and it's like fight, flight or freeze, right? A lot of people live in that space in their sexual bodies. And then we have deep dorsal, which is like collapse and disassociate. And so that's where that numbness really is. And that numbness and that low sensory access, if we're touching that part of our body really hard, we might actually be causing more harm. And if we're doing that with a vibrator, trying to get sensation, we might actually accidentally, out of good intention, right, be causing more harm. And it's important to resensitize our body at our body's perfect pace, to go slow so that we can move through that nervous system cycle. And in that, if we're coming out of like numbness and pain, often there's something to feel. That fight, flight, or freeze, we got to shake it off. There might be an emotion to move, something to emote, anger to sound, grief to be with. And on the other side of that, entirely new sensuous reservoirs open back up. But that's, again, you know, being willing to show up for ourselves, knowing that we deserve to know who we are on the other side. Yeah. It's almost like even the wand, it's like this separation, you know, of yeah. it's a stone in between us and ourselves because we are deeply afraid of touching ourselves and the vulnerability of literally being inside your body. I mean, there's no other organ where you can be inside your body. And so I do think, especially those of us who are like a little bit more squeamish, it's like, oh my God, it's it's very vulnerable. But it's like how Reiki, you know, our fingers are so powerful. And, you know, the moment you like stub your toe or something, what's the first thing you do? You put your hand on it because our hands are healing. And once I became aware of this, I noticed every time I like hit something, I would instantly want to put my hand on it. So I was like, what if I don't put my hand on it? It would continue to hurt until I put my hand on it. So we're not ever putting our, our hands on this very spot that there is hurt and there is pain and there is trauma. All it wants is our touch. All it wants is our love. And, you know, I think with using these tools like the vibrator, it can create more trauma because it's not a natural human form of movement. You know, it is mechanical. It's extremely fast. And it's setting your body up to have this quick response to this outer stimulus. And then when your body is not like that with your finger or with a partner, then the shame comes back, which gets stored into your tissues. And then you become more numb. And then the cycle continues yeah. that I do think if you're someone who is very reliant on vibrators, just to take a break, mm -hmm. take a one month break yeah. and just see what happens. Start to just get acquainted with your yoni, start to just warm your body up mm -hmm. and begin resensitizing. Yeah. And you will see that, you know, for me, from doing this practice, I'm having better orgasms now mm. by myself with my oh! finger than I ever have in my whole entire life. <laughs> Which oh, and doesn't mean so that my fingers nice. have gotten bigger or longer. Yeah. <laughs> it just means that You're I am connected. more sensitive and aware and there's more sensation. Mm -hmm. And when a woman holds that power within herself, she is not seeking anything outside of her anymore. She doesn't need to have a man, a one night stand, a whatever the thing is, because she knows that all of the pleasure that she is seeking is within herself. It just requires that 
patience. And because of how much love and going into your portal container was such a huge part of this, of like really giving myself so much love and so much patience and so much space that I'm like, I will only be in relationship with someone who treats me with this level of reverence. It sets the tone for all of your future relationships and how you want to be. And guess what? The masculine wants to serve us in this way. They want to. They just don't know how to. They're watching these movies that are showing them something else. So we think, if I take too long, I'm going to lose his interest. So let me hurry myself up for him. And he's thinking, does she like this? Does she like that? Let me try this. Let me try that. I don't know. I don't know if she's liking this. Trying a million things. And both people aren't communicating and both people aren't actually getting what they want, which is connection. It is connection, right? Oh my God. I love that. Yes. And our fingers and our own flesh, like that's self-belonging. I belong here in my body. It's me and me. This is that intimate, connection and coming home, like really coming home. And when we know our pleasure in our body, then we, like you said, it sets the tone. It's like, this is my compass now. Does this relationship or person water this? Do they want to meet me here? Can they? Do they have the capacity so lovingly? But it even does this opportunity, you know, whatever it is, it's like, wow, this is my sovereignty this is my body, this is my vessel, my temple, this is how I like it, this is how I deserve to be cared for, this is my worth, and now we go out into the world from that place. It's so beautiful, and and I love that you touch on just like in relationships, you know, when we can have clear asks, like, will you touch my vulva so slow here? what a delicious gift and invitation for them, him to serve you in that way. Like it just gets to get really juicy. Absolutely. So I want to speak now, we talk about the vaginal opening. Now inside the vagina, you go to your left side, your right side, you feel these different spots of numbness. You hold your finger there. Now getting into the G spot, can you share a little bit more? And I love the term, the God spot. Oh, that's new. I <laughs> yes, love that. Yes, because wow. it, it takes you to God. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. I've heard G pad, G spot, G reservoir. Fly like yeah. a G6. Ooh, like like a G6. Also, <laughs> we knew we had a G6 on the oh Exactly. God. Um, yeah, our G spot is a really wondrous place. A lot of women don't know about it. Um, a G spot, if you were to like insert one or, or two fingers and make a coming here motion, like up to the top of your yoni, you're going to feel your G spot. And, and what can, what are we looking for? It's like a spongy, thicker pad of tissue, mm-hmm. body of tissue. It's actually a urethral sponge. It wraps around our urethra. And this is where I am, Rita and female ejaculation comes from, which yes, I really believe that every woman can experience her waters. And again, like I believed for so long that that was not possible for me, but actually it was just a new depth of safety, of health and integrity in my pelvic bowl and my yoni, really, really, really standing up for my engorgement and my arousal so that my vulva was full, so that my yoni could be full, so that my G-spot could open her doors and her waters. Um, But yeah, the G-spot is just such a delicious and extraordinary part of our body and anatomy. And I've also had women be like, oh, I thought that something was wrong with that part of my body because they felt it and they didn't know what it is. So it's very distinct from the other tissue of the yoni. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to note, because me and my friends were talking about this stuff, and so, for some people it's lower, and for some people it's higher. And to know where is your G-spot in relation to your body, because, you know, yeah, I think for a lot of us, we're, we're just not, I, I think like we all read in Cos Magazine that like come hither, but it actually does take this like a, acquainting. Yeah. And, you know, then above the G-spot is the A-spot. A spot. So can you well, share a little so, bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so that makes me wonder, like, is my G-spot higher? Like, oh, maybe are you at A? Because A is right behind G. Mm. And I will say like, just because A is activated doesn't mean that G is, or just because G is doesn't mean that A is, right? And ultimately they're all labels because I feel like every Absolutely. part of your vagina can be orgasmic. Can be when yeah. we really awaken her 
Absolutely. When she's really well watered, her whole reservoir is just so delicious. Um, but yeah, after G, after that G pad is A. So we're deeper, still on the upper wall of our yoni. Um, A is like softer. She becomes really buoyant as she begins to fill. The G spot can, like in my body, and get to know your body. Like don't take my word for sacrament because it's not true. There's a sacrament of your body to get to know. Um, but like my G likes a lot of pulsing and my and my A is kind of like likes this like wave. Um, so yeah, you know, I think just again, knowing our pleasure pathways, knowing how we like it, knowing the language of our own bodies is just so important. And there's so much wonder in our internal spaces and, and that wonder feeds and fuels and waters our life. And next, can you talk about the cervix? Because a lot of us think you can't reach your cervix with your finger, which you showed me is not true. true. (laughs) And now I've been sharing that with all my friends, the position you shared. So can you share with us, how can we reach the cervix with our (laughs) fingers? So I like to be on my knees for my cervix. And you know what, God, it feels like a prayer sometimes. Like I maybe have a little pillow under my head and I'm just, you know, on our knees, on our knees with our legs wide open, our knees spread out so that we can really reach the body of our cervix. Our cervix is so wise. Again, we know now that the vagus nerve innervates her, which literally allows us connect to connect to nervous system safety and repair and regeneration and rewiring, right? Now we get to travel new sensory pathways within ourselves. The cervix's orgasms can truly take us to some transcendental places. And a lot of that, you know, may, if we're speaking by science, be contributed to the vagus nerve in the way that it creates brain state, brain wave change. Um, But she's just wondrous. She's the gateway to our womb. You know, for me too, the womb is like the dark feminine because she is that dark reservoir. Our cervix has multiple ligaments that attach around her to the pelvic wall, to the pubic symphysis. Our cervix can be really tight. A lot of women, when they have a pain that shocks them with deep penetration, that's cervical tension. And then we have so many other things around our cervix, like HPV is a really big thing for women right now. HPV response through allopathic care, uh, leap procedures and different things, those are pretty aggressive treatments and um Our cervix is regenerative and 98, I mean, just to bring it in, I guess, since I brought it up, but like 98% of HPV heals on its own within two years. We can feel so much shame when we get a diagnosis like that, a diagnosis around any part of our body, whether it's vulvodynia or vaginismus or, or pelvic dysfunction or, you know, all these crazy labels. And again, it's listening. It's hearing our body's story, what she's speaking and sharing. And and just if any woman is having pain at her cervix or a deep penetration, like that's your cervix saying, come love me here. I need care. Our cervix is also a really important place to know if our womb, if our uterine body is in center, if our cervix isn't straight back and she's to the side, then we can get curious, is my uterine body actually also tilted one way or another. And that would be a really, you know, important reason to receive some manual support to bring your body back into alignment and, and just that it can be such a pleasure filled orgasmic space. It's not meant to be painful. It doesn't have to be that way. And what can we look for to feel our cervix? What is the physical sensation? Yeah. Yeah. So when she's closed, she's so sacred. She opens three times in our life during menstruation, during ovulation, and during birth. Like, wow. Wow. I think that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, um, she reminds me of like like a clock. Oh, You know, of yeah. like it has to be the right time. Mm, mm-hmm. And also you shared with me, she comes up and down. Yeah, she dances. She dances in a well, integrous, dynamic pelvic bowl. Not for everybody because if we have a lot of tension patterns in our internal reservoirs and our cervical ligaments, if our womb's imbalanced and kind of stagnating her to one spot, um, she might get a little stuck, but she's meant to dance. And she dances when she's really fertile, when the whole pelvic bowl is fertile. And sometimes her tension can be so much that she has trouble opening and really receiving an egg. That's another reason, like that may be a a fertility component. Um, 
but I, but I want to circle back to how she feels, which is like the tip of our nose when she's closed. And then if we lick our lips and we get them really wet and we have a really good lip gloss on or something, <laughs> and we touch right where our lips meet, and we just have our lips not, not tight together, but just resting, she's going to feel like that. She starts to soften and blend in with the pelvic wall. So if you are feeling the hardness, that means she is not open. Yeah. And if it's not open, should we be like touching, massaging it? Like what is the best? Yeah, we can absolutely touch her and love her and bring blood flow to her. I mean, any time we touch our body, we're supporting circulation. We're supporting tissue health. We're supporting structure health. We're letting the lymph move to make it a clear, vital environment for that part of our body. We're stimulating the nerves, letting the nervous pathways know this is a safe and wonderful place to be and that they can innervate and inhabit that part of our body with wellness. Um, I mean, we're just really, truly promoting health when we touch our bodies when we touch our cervix. Um, but if we're cervical tracking, like for menstrual tracking or fertility tracking, right, she's going to get soft and high during ovulation. And then she'll be soft again during menstruation. When you are aroused, does she come down? Yeah, she can come down to meet you. Mm -hmm. She can also raise up to make space. She dances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But sometimes she'll come down and say, hey. Right. <laughs> I have found, because you shared with me that that position, and yeah. it's, so it's sort of like child's pose. Yeah, kinda. that's a really great way child's to describe it. Child's pose with like a pillow underneath your your face and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's obviously your middle finger is your longest one. It's just straight up, but mm -hmm. I would never start there. Like mm -hmm. that to me is like yeah. after you've had multiple orgasms, it's like I feel like she requires space to – be invited and open. And yeah. she's like, she's like the queen and she's like yeah. scoping it out. She's like, okay, do I like this party? Do I want to be here? This? <laughs> but wow, there's no yeah. other feeling in the world like that. Oh, oh, I'm and like, so this sad. is, and I'm like, I get like, wow, every woman, like if we knew that we had this within our bodies, like the oh. way we would treat ourselves yeah. so much differently. And yeah. it's like the most spiritual experience I've ever had oh. in my life. Yeah. It really takes you to God. It takes you to God, you know, and like I come from allopathic care. I love science and I find myself using the word sacred all the time. And, you know, it's like I don't just use the word sacred sexuality or that my orgasm felt sacred. Like I don't use it for no reason. It's because it's the most accurate word and description that I have access to for the sensation in my body. And I feel like you probably feel the same. Like. And, and the way that I feel like with these deeper internal orgasms, it's very healing. Like it heals trauma. It heals whatever emotion that you have underneath the surface of like, you might cry, you might grunt, you might what. I meet different archetypes within myself through this because it's so internal and it's you on your own that I feel like it's a very different practice of you doing it with a partner versus you on your own because you allow yourself to really go there. And that has been like my biggest path of healing after my divorce oh. of like through the path of, yeah. of pleasure. And it's not always like amazing orgasms. Like sometimes, especially towards the beginning, it would like bring up tears of grief that I was not willing, like I was just not able to really let myself feel in this dimension that when I brought myself into that tender space, it was underneath it all. And then bringing that pleasure into it and knowing that you can have both simultaneously. And it's not like, okay, sex, you got to be in your like sexy porn star mode and then like cry, like that's unfuckable. It's like, and I think ultimately what sex is for is like to make love to our shadows and to make love to our sadness and make love to our grief and make love to our rage and make love to like, I feel like we all have this like inner like witch woman in us that's like often like feels so abandoned and unmisunderstood by the masculine and like, ugh, like, and when we can make love to her and love her, it's like we come into this beautiful wholeness that to me, like no other healing practice in the world can take you to the depths that being inside your body can. Yes. Ugh. Amen, baby. Absolutely. Just so, yeah, tingling with that in it. I love that you use the word wholeness because we are meeting our wholeness and our bodies here. 
we are tending the self belonging like wow here i am i get to know safety and love in my body i get to be cherished in my body i am whole unto myself i'm with my grief my pain there still gets to be love there like it's just it's so it's so incredible and and i just share that prayer that women get to know who they are and experience themselves in this way because it brings immeasurable healing to our lives and it changes it into this like masturbation which i feel like is such a lower vibration word to like yeah. a literal ceremony with your body yeah and it takes you on a journey and every single time <laughs> you don't know where you're going to go you don't know it's going to and go it's like up. all these things and then you're like thank mm. goddess that i sat with myself in oh, this because i wouldn't yeah. have felt what i felt and totally. you know and then when we we take that understanding of women are not like fire you know in sexuality men are very much like fire it's like on it's off on on you know they just right there Whereas for women, it's like the water and it takes time for the bubbles to boil. But once we're boiling, it keeps, it stays on a boil. So I actually find like once I have the first orgasm, it starts to unlock the next series of them, which continues to go deeper and deeper. That may be the, you know, the, the clitoral vaginal opening, those are more surface levels, but the deeper ones, it just takes you to deeper levels of self than ever before. And it never stops. You can actually keep on going for forever. For it's just a pleasure <laughs> capacity thing of like totally. how much pleasure will you allow yourself to have and, and receive and surrender into what's my safety. Yeah, exactly. Totally. And then you're like, and I think that this really is an inner practice. Yeah. And I and I think one of the biggest blocks too for women and for myself is like, we don't want to make sound. Mm. You know, we don't want to mm -hmm. be heard. And- mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for people? Because I think as, you know, as children, teenagers, when you started self-pleasuring, you learn to be really quiet so yeah. no one would hear you. Yeah. So if you are someone that's like, oh my God, I'm afraid of self-pleasuring because what if my kids hear me? What if my partner hears me? What if the neighbors hear me? Yeah. How can oh, we? Oh, yum. So, and maybe this would be a really great free gift for your for your audience is I have a womb, like voice awakening practice. And really just like starting soft. Like what part of my body would I like to consciously sound from? Is that my vulva? Is that my womb? Is that my cervix? And like be where you are. If you're, if you're really meeting your vulva right now, like let's explore it there. If you're really meeting your womb right now, let's explore it there. But like, you know, maybe you just hold over that part of you and you bring in a little hum. You know, and then maybe it just starts to get bigger and louder. And again, do it in an environment where you feel safe. But with our pleasure, the more that our throat opens, the more that our breath opens, the more that our sound opens, the more that our yoni opens, the more blood flow moves down into that place, the more we stimulate that vagus nerve, the more we can expand into those higher states of pleasure. And now today, I would honestly say when I can't make sound, it feels like my orgasms and my pleasure are deeply inhibited. And like, I'm really aware of that. And I do believe that our sound is like another pole to our pleasure pathways and a really important part of them. So get with your own voice first, like really start to have these experiences when women work with me will sound at different parts of the body so that we can have our first experiences of this is safe, of this is safe. And then we get to practice. And with any practice over time, that pathway becomes more and more easeful. And my God, I think we learn a lot about ourselves when we authentic, authentically sound from pleasure. Not how we think it's supposed to sound, but like the sound that like wants to move through our body. I think that this is so huge and it's such a missing link because yes, we have seen porn where these sounds are fake. It's not actually yeah. how people would sound. It's acting and it's often very childlike. Yeah. You know, I'm just like, this is, I mean, I think there's a huge agenda behind this porn industry because I was, you know, I researched these things. So I'm like, what are they showing people? It's totally like hurting our men. Well, too. it was almost all around stepmom 
stepdad uh, stuff. And I was like, this is what they're putting into the collective subconscious. Because when you're in an orgasmic space, I mean, we know it's sex magic, the power of the manifestation power that we have in this orgasmic state. So it's like all these aroused men for the most part, they're in this very orgasmic state. And then the programming is like stepmom, stepfather, like what, like what the hell is this? And, and then, yeah, like we, and then it's just a suffocation, don't want anyone to hear. And then we're like, we're suffocating ourselves. And yes, the throat looks exactly like the vaginal opening. When we look at the organs, they're very interrelated. And I think the biggest thing is like, in the United States, we carry a lot of shame around sound. But I remember doing study abroad in Italy. I was hearing people fucking all the time. Wow. It was like yeah. very normal. Cultural. And it was just like, because they live all very close to each other. There aren't wow. soundproof apartments. <laughs> and it was, they leave their window open and they have sex, you oh. know? And it wasn't a big deal. Whereas now it's like, oh my God, I think I heard my neighbors have sex. Like, of course they're having sex. They live together. Like yeah. they're a married couple. Like they yeah. they should be having sex, you know? It's and, a beautiful thing. And it's like, why do we feel such shame around it? Why do we feel such shame around, oh, what if my kids know that I self-pleasure? It's like, bless, mom deserves to self-pleasure. Ah, oh, bless. And what if we like just we're engaged with that safety and that it is our nature that we are innately sexual beings since day one, then we wouldn't have this internal schism and confusion around it all. You know, I just, yeah, I love that. I think there's so much incredible beauty also generationally that can be watered for the generations ahead. Like as we, as sexually embodied women, women who are well in our sexual health, intimately connected, whole and belonging in ourselves, start to move in the world in a new, in that kind of way. Like we're creating ripples in our friend groups and our communities, demonstrating to our daughters, to our children, through our sexually safe, well-watered bodies, that they get to stay safe in their bodies. Yeah. So powerful. I mean, imagine if we all grew up with the role model of a woman who was living in her pleasure. And imagine how differently our mothers would have shown up in relationship with us. Imagine how different parents' marriages would be. There would probably be less divorce. Like there, we, the world would be such a more beautiful place if we all were able to share our, our pleasure and to live in it and not to feel this shame around it. So I think that, yeah, like, if you have kids, like have the conversation around, you know, what it means to be a sensual person and re releasing the shame of it early on so we don't have to like grow up and then undo this. And, you know, I think we've made it into this like traumatic thing. Like I remember as a kid, it's like, oh my God, like I think I heard my parents have sex. And it's like, mm -hmm. I'm traumatized. It's like, of course they have sex. Where do you think you came from? Yeah, like you a know? natural sound of life. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like once we're like mm -hmm. releasing this idea that this is a shameful thing, I feel more of our sound can come online. Yeah. And then the sound can actually direct the energy. Yeah. And we can use sound and toning to actually have different types of orgasm. Yeah. And like tone with our root and our sacral, <laughs> our solar plexus and heart and, and throat and third eye and all of it will have its own tone and sensation and it's all all has a different orgasmic sensation through it. And then we can actually channel it up with the Kundalini energy. And there's Ooh. so much there. Baby. <laughs> yes, baby. We all deserve this. So oh. use your sound and use release sound. the shame. You yeah. know, we need we need to release the shame that we hold on to because on the other side of that shame is our greatest pleasure and our greatest bliss oh. and our greatest healing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, right? Oh, I'm just, yeah, I'm like sinking into my body with you. I think one last piece for me on the sound is like, the more I have access to my hips, the more I can like let my belly go, let my body soften down, like really sink into my sex centers. And that sound feels more, like just more and more alive and deep and wondrous. And so, you know, there's just so much that comes from being in our body. Yes. Yeah. That's why belly dancing, oh. working, all of these have been such spiritual practices for me because I after I do my dance practice, I feel so much more sensual, so hey. much more embodied because I've actually brought my energy and focus 
down into yeah. this hip portal. Whereas we spend all of our times in our heads and then our mm -hmm. neck and our shoulders get very tense and we get this very like Saturn masculine kind of energy instead of the Venusian hip Ooh. energy. And I've noticed even mm -hmm. the way that I walk, the shape of yeah. my body, all of these things have shifted yeah. from me practicing more self-pleasure. Totally, absolutely. The way that we move in the world and what becomes possible in our life changes by the way that we are pleasured and connected in our bodies. Yeah. Oh, such a beautiful conversation. Now, where can listeners connect with you further? Yes, you can find me on Instagram at, at Origin Pelvic Care, or I have a website if you want to come to Boulder for a hands-on Origin Pelvic Care ceremony. Um, and yeah, that website's originpelviccare.com. Well, thank you so much for your devotion to this work. You really are a womb priestess of many lifetimes. I'm sure you are a goddess of Ichel, the, the Mayan mm, I love her. I goddess. Her and <laughs> we were probably in Isla de Mujeres together, which was actually an original priestess island. That's why it's called Isla de Mujeres, <sighs> Island of the Woman, where they were doing sacred womb work. So I'm just so grateful to have recrossed paths with you in this yeah. lifetime and for the remembrance that you evoked within me. Oh, babe, such a gift to be with you, to witness you and to love you. <laughs> mm. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. If you love this episode, please share it with your friends. This is a conversation that needs to be heard and leave a review for it in the iTunes store. And as a free gift, I will send you my free womb meditation, which is everything we've been speaking about in this episode. So this is a quick eight minute meditation for you to actually drop into your womb space and ask her any questions that you have really been sitting with and receive her answers. So you can leave a review for it on the iTunes store, take a screenshot and email it over to me at sahara at iamsaharrose.com. And you can find that email over in the show notes. And I'm super excited to share it with you. Thank you so much for tuning in, for being brave and courageous and listening to this episode. This is something that is new for a lot of people and, and can be edgy. So I just want to acknowledge you for being open and for saying yes and for all of the collective healing that this ripple effect will make. So I thank you for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.